Hello everyone, welcome back for more human physiology and the nervous system. So last time we talked about neurons, so now let's give glial cells their time to shine. So we've already mentioned that of all the glial cells, there are going to be some that we find in the central nervous system and some that we find in the peripheral nervous system. Oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells, the two types of cells that lay down the myelin insulation for neuron axons, are already an example of this. So in addition to that, you'll also find in the CNS, astrocytes, microglia, and ependymal cells, cells that I've mentioned before, and then in the PNS you will find satellite cells. So we're going to talk mostly about the uh, glial cells of the CNS, but all the while we want to remember these cells are not themselves sending electrical signals. They are there to in some way support or uh, facilitate a lot of the functions of the neurons themselves. So let's start by looking at the astrocytes. So this picture that you see here should really kind of give you a stark idea of just what a neuron in the CNS looks like. So this, these neurons that you see here are basically surrounded by astrocytes. These astrocytes are these little octopus looking cells that have these little arms that reach out and touch and do many different things. So as I said, astrocyte cells have these little octopus arm-like processes that form these bridges that connect the neurons to the blood supply, the neurons to uh, the ependymal cells that you see down there. So the astrocytes basically form these functional bridges that help the neurons to get things that they need, like nutrients, solutes that we need to maintain electrical excitability, as we'll talk about later, getting wastes out of the way, providing uh, substrates that neurons need for chemical reactions. <clears throat> so those are all very important, very interesting functions that the astrocyte plays, but the one that we want to focus on here is that the astrocytes help to maintain something called the blood-brain barrier. So let's talk about that. So the blood-brain barrier is there to protect the very sensitive tissue of the central nervous system. So the tissue of the brain, the tissue of the spinal cord. As you can imagine, these are very, very sensitive and very important tissues. And what the purpose of the blood-brain barrier is, is to limit what types of chemicals from the blood can come into contact with those tissues. So in this picture that you see down here, this blood vessel that you see cross-sectioned is a capillary that is providing blood to the brain or to the spinal cord, of which there are many of these capillaries. So there, as we've seen before, there are all different types of chemicals and other sorts of things that you find in the blood, whether it is oxygen, glucose, uh, carbon dioxide, hormones of many different kinds, uh, toxins that we kind of tend to accumulate uh, through our metabolic activity, things that we like to clear out through urination. So all different types of things, any drugs that we are taking, whether it's pharmaceutical or over-the-counter stuff or whatever, all this stuff ends up in our blood. And the idea is that we don't necessarily want those things to get into the tissue of the brain or into the tissue of the spinal cord. So let's discuss this. The blood-brain barrier is this physiological barrier that prevents these things from getting from the blood plasma and into the tissue of the CNS. Now, the first thing that we need to discuss is how capillaries in the brain and in the spinal cord are different from capillaries everywhere else. So everywhere else in the body besides the CNS, capillaries are very leaky because uh, the endothelial cells that you see here have little spaces in between each other called fenestrations. This may basically should give you the impression that these capillaries look a little bit like Swiss cheese, meaning that molecules that want to move from the blood plasma into the interstitial fluid, all they have to do is move through those little openings. The rules that we discussed about what kinds of molecules can cross through the membrane or not do not apply if those molecules can squeeze through these open spaces. In that way, they don't have to move across the membrane at all. So that's what these fenestrations are, and they are present in pretty much every type of capillary that exists in the body <clears throat> except 
at the blood-brain barrier between the blood plasma and the CNS. So in the CNS at the blood-brain barrier, these endothelial cells are sealed together with a type of cell-to-cell -cell junction that we talked about in chapter 4 called tight junctions. These tight junctions seal up these fenestrations, meaning that the blood vessels that feed the brain and the spinal cord are not leaky at all. And on top of that, the astrocyte little octopus arm processes lay down on top of the blood-brain barrier and help to further seal it up. So what does this mean? Does this mean nothing can move from the blood plasma into the brain or into the spinal cord? Well, clearly that's not the case because then we'd start asking questions like, how does the brain get its oxygen? How does the brain get its glucose that it has to have? How does the brain get all the other sorts of things that it needs in order to function? Well, the blood-brain barrier is not there to prevent all molecules from being transported to the brain or to the spinal cord. It's only there to prevent certain things. So what this means is that anything that is in the blood plasma here if it wants to move into the brain tissue, it's going to have to follow all those rules that we talked about in chapter 3. Meaning, what kind of molecules can move excuse me, directly across the membrane? So, uh, the types of molecules that can move across the blood-brain barrier are going to be those that are small, nonpolar, and not electrically charged. So that answers the question of how the brain gets its oxygen. Oxygen is a small nonpolar molecule, so it can just diffuse cr straight across these plasma membranes here to get into the brain. That solves that issue. Well, what about glucose? We talked about uh, in the case of regulating blood glucose back in chapter 17, we said the brain has to have glucose. Well, glucose is a very polar molecule, so it's not going to be able to move across these membranes by simple diffusion. Well, it's the same thing as always. We can get those sorts of things transported across, we just have to have a carrier or a channel for it. And thankfully, uh, the tissue of the, uh, the blood-brain barrier does have glucose transporters to always allow glucose through. And it's important to say that these glucose transporters are not insulin-dependent, meaning that we don't have to have insulin in order to get them to work. They work all the time because your brain always needs glucose. So it's the same thing as always. The blood-brain barrier will restrict the passage of anything that cannot move by simple diffusion and does not have a channel or a carrier. So really nothing has changed in that point. But the idea of fenestrations everywhere else does help us to kind of answer some things that we didn't talk about in the delivery of hormones. Think about something like insulin. Insulin is a protein hormone. It's a fairly large protein hormone. How the heck did we get it from the blood plasma and delivered to places like the liver or the adipose tissue or the skeletal muscle? Well, certainly as a protein, insulin could not have moved across the membrane of those endothelial cells. It's too big. So, it's because insulin was able to move through the little gaps in the fenestration. So that kind of helps to answer that. But the important takeaway here is that the blood-brain barrier capillaries do not have these fenestrations. So what gets into the brain and what doesn't is much more heavily regulated. And then this question down here talks about some solutes the brain needs. We've talked about oxygen and glucose. You may want to try to think about some other things that the brain might need and whether or not the brain can get them, depending on what kind of solute that you're talking about. Okay, so now let's talk about a new type of glial cell called ependymal cells. So the blood-brain barrier is a very nice thing, except it does pose one problem for us. It does not allow for efficient solute exchange between the CNS interstitial fluid and the blood plasma. So there are certain things that just in a housekeeping nature, we do need to kind of be passing back and forth, like salts, like sodium and potassium, and things of that nature. And those things are going to be very heavily restricted at the blood-brain barrier. So that is what the cerebrospinal fluid is for. So the cerebrospinal fluid is a different type of extracellular fluid that is contained within two different places. 
within these cavities in the brain called ventricles, and you can see these highlighted here in blue, and then also in the spinal cord in a central cavity called the central canal. So from here, solutes can be very easily exchanged between the cerebrospinal fluid and the tissue of the brain. It is not uh, the blood-brain barrier that separates the uh, cerebrospinal fluid from the brain and spinal cord tissue. It is actually another type of uh, glial cell called ependymal cells. So ependymal cells that line the ventricles and line the central canal, in addition to another place called the choroid plexus, where ependymal cells generate cerebrospinal fluid by filtering the blood at a point where the blood-brain barrier is weak, these are basically the barrier that exists between the cerebrospinal fluid and the interstitial fluid of the brain and spinal cord tissue. And as I was mentioning, there is no blood-brain barrier there. So we can get uh, efficient exchange of things like sodium and potassium and calcium at that place, and we don't have to worry about the blood-brain barrier. So basically the way I like to think about ependymal cells, <coughs> excuse me, is that they're not really epithelial cells, but they kind of look and behave like epithelial cells. So if we kind of back up here to that picture of the astrocytes, you can see a single layer of what looks like if we had to classify them the same way, it kind of looks like cuboidal epithelia, except these are ependymal cells. So out here where you see the astrocytes and the neurons, that would be the brain or spinal cord tissue. And then on the other side of this layer of ependymal cells would be cerebrospinal fluid. So uh, we can get a uh, solute exchange there between the CSF and the brain and spinal cord tissue without having to worry about the blood-brain barrier. All right, and then we've already talked a little bit about oligodendrocytes and uh, Schwann cells, so let's talk just a little bit more. So we've already talked about how oligodendrocytes in the CNS and Schwann cells in the PNS differ in terms of their location, but essentially they do the same sort of thing, right? They are both there to myelinate neuron axons and make sure that action potentials occur much more efficiently and much more quickly. So another thing that we're going to see here is that oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells differ in the way that they myelinate the axon. So let's take a look at this. So this oligodendrocyte that you see right here is not terribly unlike an astrocyte. It has multiple little processes or arms, if you prefer to think of them that way. And the oligodendrocyte reaches out and myelinates multiple axons at once. So uh, one oligodendrocyte can myelinate multiple axons. But as we're going to see on the next slide, Schwann cells actually wrap their entire cell body around one axon at a time. So it's kind of a one-for-one one proposition there. Yeah, so you can kind of see in a time lapse here the process of a Schwann cell wrapping itself around a neuron axon until it has gone around several times to give a good layer of insulation there. And since Schwann cells uh, wrap themselves around just one segment of an axon, for one PNS neuron to have its axon well insulated, it's going to take many, many, many Schwann cells one right after another. And as you can see there, they leave a little space in between each Schwann cell, which of course we call nodes of Ranvier. So we're not quite there yet, but I promise that those nodes of Ranvier are going to play a very important role in how we get action potentials to transmit down the axon of a myelinated axon. And we call that process saltatory conduction. So we'll cover that process in more detail later, but what you should know now is that saltatory conduction is going to be much, much, much faster of a way of transmitting information than the alternative, dealing with a completely unmyelinated axon. So like I said, signaling in unmyelinated axons will be a lot slower, so the only axons in the body that you are generally going to find that are unmyelinated are going to be ones with very short axons to begin with. It's kind of like uh, if you need to uh, 
cross the street, you could just walk there. It's not a very fast mode of transportation, but if you're just going to your neighbor's house, you don't necessarily have to get in your car and drive there. But if you're going to the grocery store, yeah, you might want to take your car if it's 10 miles away. It's 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 all kind of based on how fast your mode of transportation is and then how far does the signal actually have to go. All right, so that's going to do it for this video. Uh, join us next time, and we are just going to focus next time on this picture here so that now that we've talked about neurons and how information tends to flow, we can look at a specific example of how this might look in a homeostasis loop. So I hope you'll join me next time. See you later. Bye-bye.